Hello, welcome to the debate. I'm Kabat Akwai. The Secretary General of Lebanon's Hezbollah Movement's resistance movement has said that Israeli efforts to prevent the group from obtaining precision guided missiles have failed. Now, this comes after Israel threatened to target a Hezbollah arms facility. At this point, the question comes up why is Israel ramping up this kind of pressure on Hezbollah at this time? Furthermore, is it even capable of uh, dealing with the sheer power of Hezbollah? In this edition of the debate, we will take a look at the Hezbollah Secretary General's warning of how it is capable of striking any location in Israel in retaliation for any Israeli ad adventurism that may occur. But first, let's find out more about this story from our correspondent, Mariam Saleh, who joins us from Beirut. Well, Mariam, at this point, uh, we have seen the threat coming from Israel, and the Hezbollah Secretary General has made his stance clear. Can you tell us more about this? Well, it's definitely not a new threat. We've had these threats for years, of course, especially in this realm and after the 2006 war. Uh, but one thing that's very important that Said Nasrallah mentioned that was uh, when the Israelis, they, 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 they're just, there's just loud voices. We just have the psychological warfare. This is not real actions. We're not talking about real actions here. It is because they are incapable right now because they know that there are more than 25,000 uh, rockets. And we heard this, we have this from the Israelis media, they're sort of, you know, weeping their stance, that they cannot take action. And if they do take action, it will be a de detrimental for their um, uh, for their presence, of course. So this is why the Israelis are stuck. And the, all that they have right now is just to launch one threat after the other. On the other hand, Hezbollah does have the capabilities to launch uh, precise rockets or other rocket types of rockets anywhere in occupied Palestine, any area. And they have mentioned, Sayyid Masoud has mentioned in many speeches, in addition to this interview, that Hezbollah can target any single area or facility, whether it is for the government or for the military, in the entire um, geography of occupied Palestine. Um, so that is one thing that is very important to keep in mind. And the Israelis will continue, of course, their threats. And Hezbollah said they are also want they want to retaliate for their uh, fighters that were uh, martyred in, inside Hezbollah, inside uh, Syria. This is another issue that is keeping Israel on high alert. So this is one uh, an, an addition to its worries. They have an, an additional worry where they're trying also to get this uh, out, out of hand in some way, trying to create these scenarios um, where uh, where they would just say that there was an operation, Hezbollah launched it, and then that's it. Hezbollah has already retaliated, whereas Hezbollah, until today, they said they still have not retaliated, and we're still waiting for that operation to take place. Okay, thank you for that. We appreciate it. My name is from Beirut. Let's bring in activist and political commentator, Leith Marouf, who joins us from Beirut. Uh, Leith Marouf, uh, First, let's take a look at the Israeli threat who has threatened to target a Hezbollah arms facility. Uh, but why do you think that Israel is making this kind of a threat at this time? Well, it's threats that are empty because yesterday, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah informed us that, uh, the, you know, the response to the Americans and others that relayed the information uh, to the Lebanese government asking it, about uh, a facility in the Bekaa Valley that Hezbollah responded whether there is or there isn't any uh, Hezbollah activities in this facility in the Bekaa Valley, that if it's targeted, that they will retaliate on a location of similar value, meaning they will hit some military facility in Israel with uh, precision missiles, uh, guided missiles like cruise missiles that uh, right now uh, Hezbollah has access to. Um, so, in reality, what we see is just threats being made. Um, much um, has been revealed yesterday in the interview in terms of the capabilities of uh, Hezbollah for any future uh, military confrontation with apartheid Israel. And we can uh, discuss that more if, uh, if you want. Yeah, we will. Um, Michael Springman now joins us. He uh, is a author and former diplomat who joins us from Washington. Uh, Michael Springman, welcome. Uh, Michael Springman, maybe, uh, I mean, I, I, I know that uh, we know what this uh, uh, tension, why the tension exists between Israel and Hezbollah, but perhaps you can tell us what it is that Israel is after when it comes to Hezbollah. Why is Israel and Hezbollah, in a sense, arch enemies? 
Well, Israel, the apartheid entity, sees Hezbollah as a arm of Iran, and Hezbollah is blocking uh, its efforts to control Lebanon and to control Syria and to do their very best to destroy the operation of the countries uh, in any way possible. And uh, they, they see Hezbollah as a, uh, a uh, enemy that could be used against them. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the Bibi Netanyahu and uh, Iran's uh, atomic weapons. They all exist in his head. And Hezbollah is no threat to anyone except to whoever attacks them. Uh, in the past, the Israelis uh, were thrown out of Lebanon because uh, Hezbollah fought them fiercely and ex inflicted casualties upon them to their great surprise. So I, I think that they want to get rid of anyone that stands in the way of controlling the entire region. And Hezbollah and Iran and uh, Syria uh, are uh, forces and countries that uh, will not knuckle under to uh, Israeli aggression and Israeli, uh, Israeli diktats about how things should be done in the region. Well, Leth why don't you tell us uh, your point of view when it comes to Israel and the way that uh, it's, I should say, uh, targets Lebanon. I mean, we know, for example, it violates Lebanon's sovereignty several times a day. The last figures I'm showing here, within the first five months of 2020, the Lebanese government registered over 1,000 Israeli violations of Lebanese sovereignty by land, sea, and air. So uh, doesn't that give Hezbollah a right to be somewhat on alert, even though... <laughs> Israel violates uh, the Lebanese airspace uh, so many times, numerous times? Definitely, and this is the, the reason of existence, uh, the reason of the thought of uh, Hezbollah and the resistance in Lebanon, that apartheid Israel is continuing to occupy land and sea and violate the airspace of this country as, as if there is no sovereignty or international law. So yesterday, Beyond the uh, declaration by Mr. Uh, Sayyid Nasrallah about the possible response to an attack on uh, the facility in Al Bikaa Valley, we had a clear revelation that Hezbollah had doubled its guided missile stockpile, uh, smart missiles, and cruise missiles just in the last year. So that means that whatever the Zionists were trying to do in terms of cutting off the supply of Hezbollah from Syria, it didn't succeed. Secondly, we heard uh, a, another bombshell, which was that Hezbollah had targeted multiple Israeli drones over the last year. Some of them were shot down, some of them were chased away in the air by the air defenses, and some uh, taken over by the electronic systems and that this was not told to anybody before. Um, the reason was that uh, it was just some hints to the uh, Israeli army to know, uh, military to know what capabilities are, are at the hands of Hezbollah. And since then, we heard also that all uh, Israeli drones that have entered the airspace of Lebanon since those uh, hidden actions that Hezbollah did have been flying at a much higher altitude and only with escorts of F-16s to protect them, to hit back at any, anything that targets them. And finally, we heard that Hezbollah has the uh, sea defense systems that can hit any uh, Israeli warships or uh, oil and gas facilities that could uh, encroach on Lebanese sea, uh, interna international waters the Lebanese waters uh, and, you know, the debate that is happening right now on negotiating on the territory and the water for the gas reserves that are there. So those are huge uh, disclosures. And we know definitely the Israeli media was covering them all day. Well, Michael Springman, uh, uh, in uh, many ways, the U.S. Uh, has uh, presented Hezbollah to the world through its media arms and Western media organizations in general, that it's, uh, it's the bad guy and has labeled it as a terrorist organization. And, you know, our guest here uh, has quite rightly described all the different uh, types of ammunition that uh, is at hand for Hezbollah.
But the reason that Hezbollah has the ammunition that it has, I talked about the violation of the, Israel, of the Lebanese airspace. But it's the type of threat that Israel has posed for the country of Lebanon. Because with, uh, Lebanon without Hezbollah would no longer, by many analysts, be a Lebanon. It would be Israeli territory. Because Israel would, by their accounts, come and invade Lebanon, perhaps. So, um, and not to mention how Hezbollah is part of the Lebanese government. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, it's not Hezbollah who's the bad guy here. It's the at provocative actions by Israel, if you agree. Oh, exactly. Uh, Hezbollah exists to defend Lebanon and to defend Syria and act as a forward defense of Iran, from what I can see. And the Israelis want complete control of the region. They don't want any one in the area to have any armed forces or weapons that can hit back at their provocative uh, illegal uh, actions uh, uh, that are essentially murder, war crimes, and human rights violations. And as long as the Israelis can get away with this, they're happy. The Americans back them. I think the American State Department even uh, listed Hassan Nasrallah's son as uh, being a terrorist. It's on their list now. Uh, but you never see the, uh, any of the Israelis being on the American terrorist list, eh, despite what they've done to Lebanon and what they've done to Syria and uh, uh, what they're doing in, uh, in northern Iraq and elsewhere. So I, I think it's basically uh, the, good, uh, the best defense is a good offense. The, they're continue, the Israelis and uh, their subordinates, the Americans, uh, are basically uh, doing their best to direct everyone's attention away from what the Israelis are doing uh, and their illegitimate entity there on the, uh, uh, the banks of the, the Mediterranean. And uh, if the Israelis were held to account, if, if the light of day were really shined upon them, uh, the country would, if it's a country really, uh, would evaporate. So, Leith Maruf, you talked about all the different assets that uh, Hezbollah has, uh, such as, uh, you know, these uh, precision-guided missiles. You talked about some of the uh, sea assets that it also has, amongst other things uh, that uh, show that Hezbollah is not the same Hezbollah that it was back in 2006, that it is more advanced, that is, it has an arsenal that's more complete and uh, has added to its arsenal throughout these years. So, um, it, and I think you mentioned that Israeli threats are pretty much hollow. What would it take for Israel to act uh, would there be an incident? Because we know that Hezbollah has uh, still said that they are going to, for example, take revenge for one of their fighters that was killed in Syria by the Israeli airstrike. Definitely. Yesterday, uh, Sayyid Nasrallah referred to this situation. Uh, he said that up to now, uh, Hezbollah is very satisfied with the uh, apartheid army standing on a leg and a half, as they said, basically waiting in the corner for their punishment, um, withdrawn from most of the forward bases on the border. Uh, and uh, he, he referred to the fact that it's been now multiple times that the IDF uh, sent drones that are, you know, and not drones as in planes, but remote controlled vehicles uh, that had in them mannequins to pretend that there's somebody there to give Hezbollah a target to hit and then defuse the situation. Um, we've seen that earlier this year also with that, uh, you know, bomb defusing robot that had a mannequin on it. He said that this has happened multiple times uh, over the last few months and that uh, Hezbollah's fighters are ready to hit these targets, but they have the orders to verify a living being inside any bases or vehicles before they hit them because Hezbollah doesn't want to uh, lose this advantage of the deterrence uh, that has kept the Israeli army on, on you know, standing on one leg uh, for the last uh, five months. And so, as you know, what is expected, uh, as Mr. Nasrallah told us yesterday, is as soon as the Israeli army uh, lifts down some of its uh, high uh, emergency uh, posture, uh, there will be a response and there will be uh, a clear equal to the assassination of a Hezbollah member. Before that, there will be no response. It's not, it's not the bang that Hezbollah is looking for, but the actual deterrence and the actual action and equality. Well, Michael Springman, we uh, are looking at the last few weeks of uh, the administration of U.S. President Donald Trump, I think. 
until he is actually out, some people still have doubts. Uh, even uh, Said Hassan Nasrallah has called Trump angry. He's used that word, and he's called him crazy. <laughs> so, uh, by crazy, I'm guessing that he thinks that Trump, uh, together with Israel, maybe are calculating some kind of military action. Am I correct to read Said Hassan Nasrallah's thoughts on this this way, do you think? I would say so. There's an awful lot of talk going around uh, on the internet and emails and uh, even the, uh, some of the mainstream press about what will really happen between now and the time uh, Joe Biden takes office January 20th. And the suggestion is that the, uh, the Israelis and the Americans will look at uh, one more chance uh, to strike at Iran, to strike at uh, uh, Iran's, uh, uh, the organizations that Iran is advising and assisting. And uh, in between administrations and over uh, Christmas, New Year's, when the American government is virtually uh, uh, dysfunctional, uh, although it's been like that for the last year since the virus, uh, I, I think that uh, they would see this as a great opportunity to, to strike and uh, escape any kind of punishment because people are too concerned with New Year's or too concerned with uh, getting uh, Washington ready for the Biden administration. So I, I think uh, Said Nasrallah has some uh, feeling for this. Okay, and I'm going to address the same question to you, Leith Maruf, because uh, Nasrallah did uh, say that. I don't know if I should use the word concern, but he certainly called Trump angry and crazy. Do you think they are looking, Israel and perhaps the U.S. together, looking uh, at some type of military action? Well, he, Sayyid Nasrallah yesterday informed us that they are on highest alert up until the transfer of power that may happen. You see, he, he, he actually said that he's not sure that Trump is going to leave, and he laughed when he said that. Uh, we also know that uh, Sayyid Nasrallah revealed yesterday that um, Mohammed bin Salman, the uh, you know cr crown prince of Saudi Arabia, in his first meeting with Trump in the White House, uh, demanded that Trump assassinates Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, and that uh, Trump approved it, but said uh, that uh, Israel will be the one implementing that assassination, uh, which MBS Mohammed bin Salman responded to by saying he's ready to cover the cost of the assassination operation and any damages that happen to apartheid Israel. So we know that there is serious uh, direct possibility of an assassination uh, attempt against Sayyid Nasrallah in the last uh, next uh, 20 somewhat days that are left of uh, this administration. And uh, the resistance here in Lebanon is taking it seriously, and I'm sure the, the rest of the axis of resistance uh, in uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, and Yemen are also on highest alert. Well, indeed. And Michael Springman, that brings me to the question that I left somewhat uh, for the end of this program, and that is how Said Hassan Nasrallah has repeated vows that uh, Iran and its allies will avenge the U.S. killing of the commander of uh, Iran's Revolutionary Guard, Qasem Soleimani, which happened in a drone attack a year ago in Iraq. And Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah did say, quote, that revenge is coming no matter how long it takes. Uh, do you think that's going to be sooner than later or at a later point? No, so it's really hard to say. I don't have a crystal ball or a gypsy fortune teller, uh, but I, I, I would say I would for certainty that there will be retaliation uh, and it will be a time and place uh, of uh, uh, Nasrallah's choosing or Iran's choosing or whoever will be doing the acting's choosing. Uh, it's uh, the longer they wait, the more anxious they get and the, and the sloppier they might get in their thinking and their, in their defenses. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, to the advantage of the people striking back to wait and make people wonder where and when and how and chase around looking for boogeymen under the bed and trying to strengthen and protect everything they possibly can, uh, which is impossible to do. You can't defend everything in the world. So I, I, if I had to say later than sooner, I would say later. And same question to you, Leith Maruf. Do you think that uh, this very serious statement and posturing, I should also say, 
uh, of the revenge that Said Hassan Nasrallah has talked about. Iran's leader and many high-ranking Iranian military officials have also stated that will happen sooner than later or will it happen at a later time? Well, yesterday Sayyid Nasrallah quoted uh, Ayatollah Khamenei and said that everybody who is responsible for planning, ordering and implementing the assassination uh, will be held responsible, will be and is a target and specifically said even Trump is a target and that uh, those who are of free will around this world, the free peoples of the world, individuals, movements and states will be working towards that. So, I, you know, for me, I expect that after Trump is, uh, leaves office, if he leaves office on January 20th, he should probably always watch his back. We'll leave it at that. Author and former diplomat Michael Springman, thank you for your thoughts. And activist and political commentator Laith Maruf there from Beirut. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of The Debate. From me, Kovetai, my entire team here in the capital, Tehran, it's goodbye. The Institute's mission statement says that it seeks to advance American policies in the Middle East. The Washington Institute for Near East Policy was started by Martin Indyk. He officially announced dual containment strategy for Iran and Iraq to serve Israeli interests. The Washington think tank strategy is to stop the growing power of Hashtag Shabi in the first step in order to expand Israel from the Nile to the U.S.